Hello from Salado United Methodist Church. This is our bi-weekly Bible study that we do. We follow the Revised Common Lectionary and the text we're using for today are for the sixth Sunday after Easter. Uh, the first text is from the book of Acts, which is the first lesson that we have during Easter Eastertide. Um, what has happened up to this particular point in our study is that uh, we have a fellow named uh, Philip. He's, uh, he's converted the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, and when I say converted him, the Ethiopian eunuch was already a god fear, which meant that he was a Gentile that followed along the Jewish path of faith. And uh, so he and Philip have an encounter on the road down to Gaza from Jerusalem, and uh, they run into a body of water in that desert region. And uh, then our friend Philip uh, jumps out of the chariot uh, with the Ethiopian eunuch and he baptizes him. And uh, the eunuch goes on his merry way rejoicing, we're told. And uh, the Holy Spirit uh, takes Philip and he drops him down in the city of Azotus. So uh, then we have the story of the so-called conversion of Saul. He becomes Paul. He's on the Damascus Road. So first we have the Gaza Road. Now we have the Damascus Road. And after that story, we have um, uh, Paul who is... Um, uh, becomes a, a disciple of Jesus and he goes to Jerusalem. Um, then eventually we get to Peter and uh, Lydda in, in Lydda and Joppa. And uh, then we have this marvelous story in uh, chapter 10 of uh, Acts of the Apostles. And uh, this is the story of the encounter of Peter and Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman soldier. Uh, just to say he's a soldier, he was a centurion in the Italian cohort. So it meant that he was a great leader. And uh, Paul is summoned to his house by a dream and the Holy Spirit. And uh, they have a encounter and uh, Peter converts uh, Cornelius, and some people say that uh, this is the first Gentile that is converted to uh, the Christian faith. Although you could make a case that the Ethiopian eunuch was the first Gentile that was converted, but I'm not gonna get into there. But uh, after uh, Peter converts Cornelius, then he preaches to the people in Cornelius's house, and they are all converted after hearing the good news. And then we have what is um, in, in Luke's style of writing a summary. Every so often, and I think there's four of these, they're basically a paragraph that kind of draw the action together and tie it off. And uh, Luke does this several times in the book of Acts. Today, uh, this sort of summary tells the story about the Gentiles who received the Holy Spirit. And uh, if you're following along in this part of Acts, chapters eight, nine, and 10, uh, you will notice that uh, there is a lot of Holy Spirit business going on. And so, the text begins at uh, verse 44 of Acts uh, uh, 10. It says, while Peter was still speaking, that is while Peter was still sharing the good news with the Gentiles that were in uh, Cornelius's house, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. That is, the Holy Spirit falls on all of those who were in the house of Cornelius, and they are converted basically 
uh, by the Holy Spirit. Now, you remember that this is uh, this is sort of, and, and I'm making this up, I guess, uh, we remember the day of Pentecost when the Spirit falls on all the Jewish Christians that were in the upper room and they all begin to speak in known tongues. And there's a whole list of, uh, of the languages that, that they spoke, uh, Media, uh, uh, Cappadocia, and so forth. Um, there's probably, I don't know, 10 or 12 different languages and people could all understand each other when these converts that had the Holy Spirit in them were speaking in their known tongue. This situation will be slightly different in that this is sort of a Pentecost story for Gentiles. These are all Gentiles and the Holy Spirit, as it says, fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter. And when you see the word circumcised believer, that is just another way to say a Jewish Christian. Jews are all circumcised, but they've converted to Christianity, so they call them circumcised believers who had come with Peter. Peter always traveled with this little entourage, not necessarily uh, a massive group of people, but a significant group of people, maybe five or, or 10 people, uh, went with him to help him, to protect him, to travel with him, to learn from Peter, because in a sense like Paul, Peter was mentoring a group of people that would be the next generation of apostles. So those who had come with Peter were astounded. They were just shocked, shocked that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Now these were Jewish Christians, had little regard for Gentiles who are non-Jewish. And um, this is kind of an amazing thing about how we in our human prejudices, you know, will just make value judgments on other people. Uh, sometimes when I travel to some ministerial thing or church business up north and people find out I'm from Texas, there will be some that sort of look down their noses and say, you must be pretty ignorant if you're from Texas. And of course, Texans have a similar or worse view of what we call Yankees. And so everybody has their own sorts of prejudice. When it gets bad is when there is violence or law breaking involved with these prejudices. And uh, one of the things that the gospel tries to do is do what uh, Ephesians talks about when it says, about uh, knocking down the walls uh, that divide us, knocking down the walls of hostility. And so here we have that these Jewish Christians, these circumcised Christians are just amazed that the Holy Spirit could fall out on uh, Gentiles thinking, they were thinking, surely the Holy Spirit of God has more discernment than to be given as a gift to a bunch of Gentiles. Uh, for they had heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Now, in this particular case, the speaking in tongues is of glossolalia, which means that they're speaking unknown languages that are probably not languages, they're spirit languages or spirit talk. Whereas in chapter two, when the Holy Spirit came on those uh, circumcised Jews that were in the upper room, they spoke languages that were known. And so this is one of the differences. Now I've never heard anybody say that this is a second Pentecost story, but I'm sure others have because obviously the Holy Spirit falling on this unique group of people sounds a lot like what happened uh, when we were talking about uh, uh, the Pentecost story in Acts 2. Then 
Peter said, okay, he stopped speaking. They had this experience of the Holy Spirit falling upon them. And then Peter says, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit? And then he adds, and it's for effect, just as we have. In other words, what Peter is doing is elevating these uh, particular Gentiles that have had the Holy Spirit fall on them so that they are on equal footing with the circumcised Christians or the circumcised uh, Jews. So Peter ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, so here's the baptism. Uh, the eunuch was baptized. Uh, people were baptized in uh, chapter two. People are baptized or these Gentiles that were in Cornelius's house are all baptized also. And, and then it says, then they invited him to stay for several days. And uh, you can't understand this just from reading the English, but that word stay means in Greek to share the salt, which means to eat together. And one of the signs in the New Testament, anyway, of uh, acceptance of another is to be willing to sit down and eat with those people. And uh, it's uh, some of the nastiest fighting that goes on. And we see this at the very beginning of Paul's letter to the church at Galatia is uh, this idea of table fellowship and the problems that it creates. And uh, one of the things that food does is it brings people together, but it also can divide people in uh, certain ways. Um, you've all been to weddings or banquets or something where the seating arrangement can create some interesting conflicts among those who are participating. Anyway, that's kind of a summary of what happens at the end of Cornelius' uh, house. And then uh, uh, Peter will go on and he'll go to uh, the church at Jerusalem. And then eventually uh, Peter and, uh, and uh, Paul get uh, hooked up together. And, uh, and then the rest of the book of Acts is pretty much about the Apostle Paul. Let's look at uh, Psalm 98. It's, uh, it's a psalm that basically you could call a psalm of praise to the judge of the world, which would, of course, be Yahweh or God. Uh, it begins in verse one. There are nine verses, I believe, in this psalm, and we will look at them. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gotten him victory. So this song, this psalm starts out about talking about the glory of God. And when we talk about the right arm of God, we're talking about the power and magnificent of, magnificence of God. Uh, I don't need to go into all of this, but the right arm is usually the strong arm for most people. Uh, there have been times in history, in fact, in most of history, where parents would try to make children who were naturally left-handed, try to make them right-handed for, for, uh, for different reasons. Uh, mostly school desks have been made in the olden days anyway for right-handers. Uh, a lot of sports equipment is made almost exclusively for right-handers. And probably in the 60s with Dr. Spock and people like that, there was this sort of opening up and acceptance of, of left-handers, let people be left-handed. Um, and, and, and so when this talks about the, his right hand and his holy arm, it's talking about power and strength because usually the right hand is the dominant one. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. And that word nations there means also Gentiles. And so 
God has demonstrated God's power before all of the people. God or Yahweh has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness in the house of Israel. All of the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. So not only does God remember what God's promise is to God's people, but God also demonstrates these things in front of everyone, which uh, should be kind of convincing to folks. And then it says, and this is, of course, uh, one of the praise psalms that we have, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth break forth in joyous song and sing praises. And so the business about singing and praising God, that is something that uh, these faithful people do. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, which is a harp-like instrument, with the lyre and the sound of the melody. And so the more pleasant the song, the more pleasing it is to God. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, which could be talking about the shofar, which is the ram's horn, but there are other kinds of horns and they had trumpets. They make a lot of noise. And uh, I'll, I'll, I never will forget I was sitting in the front of one of my churches and it had a kind of a steep incline. So you just looked right into the middle of the congregation and it was on Easter Sunday morning and everybody was sort of meditating and they had their heads down or they were looking at the bulletin or something like that. And we had this magnificent trumpet player and all of a sudden he hit that first note and it was loud and it was joyous and it was pretty shocking to everybody in the congregation. And I noticed they all jerked their heads up at the same moment as if they had all been hit with a, with a hot rod or um, some kind of electric prod. When you think of trumpets in worship, you think of things along those lines. Make a joyful noise before the king, the Lord. Let the sea roar. So we've had human beings worshiping God with trumpet and lyre and the horn. Now we have the natural world, which is singing its praises to God in its own way. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and all those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. It's a, a serious metaphor of water clapping its hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. And so one of the reasons that people praise God so uh, seriously is because God is the judge of the world. He will judge the world with righteousness. That means with justice, or he will judge it right wise. That's what righteousness means. And the people with equity. In other words, all will be equal uh, before the Lord and before the Lord's judgment. Uh, that's a, a very interesting song. And so I'd like to thank you for uh, being with us today. And uh, we're going to uh, see you later in the week. And uh, later in the week, we will take a look at a, a, a small passage from for the letter to 1 John. We've been in that for uh, five weeks now and also from the Gospel of John. So thank you for being with us today.